In this video, we're going to explore different types of graphs and displays you can use for descriptive statistics. Now, one of those is the stem and leaf plot, where a stem and leaf plot, we take a number and we separate it into its stem and its leaf, and then we're going to sort our data into the plot. It's going to be somewhat similar to a histogram, except all the values are still going to be contained within the plot, so you'll be able to see all the numbers. And the leaves, which are the right-hand side, are always 0 to 9, and then our stems can be any size depending on the rest of the values that we're dealing with. For example, as you see here, when we have 26, the stem was 2, which is our tens unit, and then the leaves were all the ones units. Now to create a stem and leaf plot, first thing we want to do is figure out how are we going to split our values so for our stems and our leaves. Pretty much your leaf is always going to be your rightmost value within whatever the number is. And then your stem is going to be everything else to the left. It's always important to include a key so that people know what, is, what does your stem mean and what does your leaf mean. Then you want to take and put your stems in order from lowest to highest so that you make sure that every value will be included within your stem and leaf plot. To do this, one of the easiest things to do is to first order your data so that you can tell what's my smallest value, what's my largest value, so that I know all my stems and all my leaves. Now once I have my stems in place, I want to draw a vertical line that goes from the first stem all the way to the last stem, and now I'm going to start to write in all of my leaves from my values. And that's where having your data in order in the first place makes life a lot easier. If not, you're going to have to recopy it and reorder all your leaves. So instead, start with your data ordered, then create your stem and leaf plot. When you're doing it, you're also going to start looking for patterns. What's our range? That's your highest value minus your lowest value. Where's the center when I look at my stem and leaf plot? What's the spread look like and the shape? Those are all things to consider, and it's one of the reasons we put it into a stem and leaf. So here's an example. We're looking at the amount of text messages sent uh, from a group of people on the first floor of a college dorm. Now this data is unordered, so the first thing I would want to do if I had it was order my data so that I can figure out what are all my data points. Now I know in this data my lowest point is 78 and my highest point is 159. What that means is I've got to pay attention to what's in my stem and what's going to be in my leaf. In this case, I'm going to use that rightmost digit as the leaf and everything else will be my stems. So if I'm going 78 and 159, I know that the tens and the hundreds place are going to have to be part of the stem so that that ones unit can be the leaf by itself. So 78 would be split with 7 slash 8, 159 would be split 15 slash 9. So I need to include every number from 7 to 15 for my stems. And then I'm going to start to fill in my leaves. So as I do that, you can see I have 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and then I just went 78, 105, 108, 109, 99, 112, 112, 112, and I continue to do that. If I have something like 130, I do put that zero there. That's important. And the other thing I want to make sure to include is a key. Keys are very important to tell people what exactly is happening in your stem and leaf plot. So if I look at this display, I could conclude that more than 50% of cell phone users uh, sent between 110 and 130 messages, this group right here. That's definitely more than half. Now another type of uh, graph I could make is called a dot plot. In this one I'm going to use a horizontal line with the values below it and I'm going to choose intervals that include every location for every point to be plotted and I'm going to put a dot above each of those numbers. So if I had my data here, same data I just had, for one example before, I draw up my number line, as you can see it's all down here with all the numbers, and then I put a point for each of those, 21, 25, 25, 26, and you can see if I have multiple values I just push up the points, and there would be like point 26. So if I had that same data, or I had, I'm sorry, this one I got new text messaging data, and I'm going to want to do the same thing. And I have all my numbers from 70 to 160. It is the same data here. 
and I just put points for every single one of these values. And you can see here at what looks like 126, it showed up 05 times within my data. And I could use that to look at the center of the spread and that type of information as well. Now, other types of charts I can make, I can actually use Excel. The first two, it's very difficult to use Excel, whereas these next ones we look at will use Excel a lot to help us. The first one's a pie chart, which divides our categories, often used with qualitative data here, into, into different sectors that represent how much it actually represents of all of our data. So, let's look at an example here. Say the number of motor vehicle occupants killed in crashes in 2005 are shown in this table and it has all the frequency information. Now if I want to use a pie chart, I can use the frequency information, but it's much better to use the relative frequency to help me out with understanding how much area will be of the circle for each of those categories. So that would just be taking the total frequency and dividing each of the individual ones by the total. Now I'd want to actually graph this into my pie chart. So I'm going to use Excel. So here's my data. If I want to make my pie chart, I'm going to highlight just my relative frequencies. I go Insert, Pie, and I'm just going to click on the very first one. Now I need some more information than this, so I can choose this quick layout. And I'm going to find one that has the title at the top as well, so that would be Layout 6. My chart title would be car crash death or automobile deaths. Now you can see I've got the percents there already. What I do want is instead of having this 1, 2, 3, 4, that doesn't make any sense. So I want to change my key so that it matches with my categories. So I'm going to right click, I'm going to select my data, and again it's that horizontal axis I want to change, and that's just going to be my categories. But now if I look, I've got my title, I've got my key, and I've got the percents in there to help me out. Another type of graph is called the Pareto chart. In a Pareto chart, it's going to take the it's going to take categories, but what we do is we separate them from the greatest frequency to the least frequency. So, greatest to least, and then we just make a bar chart with it. So say we have this problem here where retail industry is losing money and here's all the different ways that they're losing the money and they want us to make a Pareto chart so we can kind of do some description of what's going on. So if I come down here, the first thing I want to do with the Pareto chart so that it does put my data in order is sort it. So if I highlight these four values and I go sort and filter from largest to smallest because I want the greatest one first. It's going to ask me to expand, which I definitely want to do. And I now see that all my categories are in order from greatest to least. Now with my data highlighted, I go insert and I'm going to use column. And I can just do the two column, just like I've done with the histogram, but I don't need to connect these. So an easy way to go from here is I'm going to choose layout 9 and just delete out the series value there. My axis title, I could say this is category and this is loss in millions of dollars. And this could be in this case, it was um, industry industry loss, industry losses. Now, last thing I want is to change my horizontal axis. So I right click, I'm going to select my data. It's again that horizontal I need to change. And I just highlight my categories, and there I have each of my categories separated. So what I could conclude is that the greatest amount of loss comes from employee theft followed by shoplifting. Now my next one, the paired data set, we also call that a scatter plot. And that's showing a relationship between two quantitative variables. And we'll do a lot more with this later, but we'll show exactly how you can do this with 
Excel. So say that I wanted to check how the amount of time spent studying versus the grade. So again, it's two values. So I'm going to highlight both of my sets of data here. And I go insert, scatter. And I'm just going to choose that first scatter plot. And you can see that gives me an idea. If I looked at that, there's this general trend that looks like the values are going up as the amount of time. So it's great to have a, we don't need the series, but we definitely need our axis titled. So this was grade, and this was time spent studying. And we don't necessarily need a chart title for this. But as I can see, the grades gradually go up as the time spent studying. And we'll do more with this later in the semester. The last one we'll look at is the time series. In a time series, it's going to connect the dots to see if there's any types of patterns as we go over a period of time. For example, say that we're looking at the telephone, cell phone subscribers in millions from 95 to 2005. Again, we have our data here. This time, I'm just going to highlight the subscribers because I'm doing this timeline. I don't need the year actually highlighted. And I'm going to do a line. And I want one that has the markers included. Now what I need to recognize now is that my x-axis is going to be my year. So I'm going to right click on my x-axis and I'm going to select the data for the horizontal again. Push OK. And I have there's my years. Now I need to format it like I format all the others. So this could be subscribers. And then give it a chart title. And I do not need the series. Delete that out. And now I have my time series as well.